but my thanks for the Valley Economic Alliance, Ken. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks for putting me on after the dancer. <laughs> That's cool. Um, because geriatrics is awesome after, right? Okay. Um, uh, my name is Jason Greenspan. I am a, a father and a son, like um, many of you. Um, I'm also a Valley kid. I live in Sherman Oaks. Um, and I'm an emergency room doctor, and I do ER work for six of the emergency departments of, I think, the 12 in the San Fernando Valley. Um, and as you can imagine, that's got challenges. So today I'm going to talk to you about, like, my biggest problem, right? I mean, other than the fact that I'm not 6'9 and good-looking, this is my biggest problem, and it's the future of geriatric care that I think we've done a lot of good work over at Encino Hospital to try to fix. Um, this is my issue. This is the census data from 2010 that shows you that we're getting old and gray and we're doing it fast. <laughs> Some of us faster than others, but fast, right? So look at this graph, right? Um, in 1900, we were young, and in 2010, we're not so young anymore. Um, but here's the problem, and my father hates it when I put up this slide. That's my dad and his <laughs> wife. Right? Um, but here's the problem. Um, uh, these are two very active 70-year-olds. Um, just got back from a three-week trip to the British Isles. Um, they take a couple different medications. They have a duff couple different comorbid conditions. But by and large, these are healthy people. They live independently. They still do stuff, right? Um, and so when you looked at the data before that showed the 65-year-old and over population getting as big as it's getting, it's them. But they're not my problem. They are. Those are my grandparents. Um, I know, right? You thought my dad hated this, right? Um, um, so that's my, my, my mother's father and my mother's mother. I will tell you I've given this speech and this, this talk a couple times. This is the first time that I will tell you um, that this is kind of in memory of them. Um, both of them passed away in the last, uh, the last year. Um, up until they passed away, they lived together in their apartment where you see them pictured. Um, and as you can imagine, they had multiple medical problems. Um, they had arthritis to the point where uh, my grandfather, who used to build boats, couldn't put his shoulders above here. Um, and my grandfather, who used to um, uh, love reading scripts and reading, couldn't see for macular degeneration. And my grandmother had cancer and Alzheimer's. Um, and yet they lived actively and independently taking medications and supporting each other and things like that. They were an amazing couple. Um, but, but in terms of the lecture, they're my issue. They're my problem because they're different, obviously, than my healthy 70-year-old parents, right? Um, and here's why they're my problem. Because the general population on the left grows at about 9.7% a year, right? We're getting bigger as a country. The greater than 65-year-olds, right, my parents, um, are growing at about 50% faster, right? About 15% um, growth over the year. But my grandparents, the 85-year-olds, are growing at a rate three times as fast as the general population. We're getting old, and we're getting gray, and they need help, as you can imagine. So as an ER doctor, what do they come see us for, right? I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm the guy that the mayor said, like, you know, when everybody comes crashing in the paramedics, like, it's me meeting you at the door, right? Um, so when you're 85 years old and you come crashing in, what, do you, what are you coming crashing in for? Well, this is what you have, right? You have injuries, and sometimes they're big injuries, and sometimes they're not. Um, uh, and I'll tell you is that I have a, a big, you know, a big issue managing 85-year-olds who fall down. Not fall down from like buildings, but like, you know, are walking and fall down. So they come in with injuries. They come in with respiratory issues. They come in with heart problems. They come in with stomach conditions. They come in with neurologic conditions, right? Which is why I'm teamed with Dr. Marvey to do this telemedicine thing in the Valley. And they come in with behavioral and psychiatric issues. For those of you who have parents and grandparents, and you know, you know these, right? And by the way, that is exactly the same list that the young people come in for. Not too much different, OK? But here's the problem. So while they're currently only about 15% of what I see and getting bigger every day, they account for 43% of all hospital admissions. 
about 50% or half of the spaces sent into the intensive care units. They stay about 20% longer in the hospital than the younger people. They use 50% more labs and radiology resources. And they're four times as more often to need social services. Anybody take care of an older person in the community? Anybody take care of an older family member in the community? Anybody an older person in the community? <laughs> right? You know this, right? And this is why. Right? They have comorbidities. They have issues. They have medical problems. They have at least three to four illnesses on average, and they take medications. Um, I'm going to come back to this, but statistically, 40% of patients these days take over five medications. That means half of those people are having a reaction to their medication that's making them sick. Okay, 20% or 18% take about 10 medications or more, and all of them are getting sick from their medicines. They have obviously social issues, including caregiver issues, access to care. Yes, they use alcohol and drugs, by the way, okay? Um, and abuse and neglect. And obviously, there's some cognitive understanding issues and some things like that that obviously manage with an older population. So we're going to do a little example. Um, where are my nursing students? I told you I was going to pick on you, right? So the guy who I told was going to pick on left, right? <laughs> it's not fair. So I'm going to pick on their instructor, OK? So, so here's, a, here's a little thing, right? Um, uh, you're a nurse, right? Yes. OK, good. So this will be easy for you. 45-year-old male comes into the emergency department. He's got crushing chest pain. Oh, it hurts. And it's reading into his jaw and his arms. And he's pale and he's sweaty. And look, he's got no medical history. And he doesn't take any medications. But he smokes. And his blood pressure is sky high. And his heart rate's going a little fast. And his breathing a little fast. Um, but he's awake. And he's telling you, ah, my chest hurts. What's wrong with him? He has a heart attack. Does he have a heart attack? He's got a heart attack, right? Like, you're a cardiologist, right? You know this. Yeah. OK. Um, and so right? I, I didn't ask the neurologist. It's all right. Um, uh, so, so here's the thing. Um, it, it took my nursing friend 10 seconds to know that this guy was having a heart attack. And, and therefore, as an ER doctor and a cardiologist, I can get busy getting this fixed, right? Time is myocardium. Get busy, get it fixed, because I know what's going on. Who's the smartest guy in the room? Are you the smartest guy in the room? Oh. No. All right. You, you, you run a hospital, right? Yeah. All right, perfect. <laughs> um, so 90-year-old man um, comes in with dizziness, trouble breathing. He's a little bit more lethargic than usual. This is what his care provider is telling you. He's got diabetes and high blood pressure and high cholesterol, right? Risk factors for and... Heart disease, right? Um, he's got atrial fibrillation and congestive heart failure, obstructive lung disease, dementia, prostate cancer. You think I'm making this up, right? But this is what 85-year-olds have. And they're on 12 different medications, including a blood thinner, something for your blood pressure, your diabetes, and a pain medicine, and something to help them sleep. Um, for those of you who are medical professionals, the doctors and the nurses at the room, you should be looking at this medication list, and there should be red flags flying all over the place because every single one of those medications that I'm listing is on a high-risk list. Okay? He smokes. He's got exactly the same blood pressure and vital signs as the 45-year-old did. Right? What's wrong with him? Beats the heck out of me. <laughs> and listen, I'm good at this. Right? Beats the heck out of me. And that's the problem, is because they're confusing and they're hard. But the fact is, is that this is a decent presentation for someone having exactly the same heart attack as the 45-year-old. It took my nursing friend 10 seconds to diagnose. So what does this lead to? Well, it leads to delay in diagnosis. It leads to delay in time-sensitive care. We just heard Dr. Marvey talk to you about an entire telemedicine presentation about how to get stroke care to people. Because I need to do this fast. And I need to do it fast with heart disease. I need to do it fast with stroke. So it leads to a delay because i got to figure it out first before I even know to call them, right? And we undertreat. We don't give enough pain medication. And we don't give TPA enough. And we don't give heart disease patients uh, enough treatment. And we overtreat. We do too much because we think we're trying, right? So we overtreat. We undertreat. And we talked about bounce backs and readmissions because we treat once, but like a quarter of them come back even after you think you fixed them, right? So what could possibly be going wrong, right? Uh, this is my shout out to the smartest doctor I know, Dr. Seuss, right? 
And, and by the way, like, if, if you haven't figured out, I'm not sure if this is the worst job in the world or that's the worst job in the world, right? <laughs> um, uh, see, yeah, yeah, it's all about perspective, I guess, right? Okay, so what did we do? Listen, we've got a big problem, a big problem. And Encino Hospital Medical Center um, took on the challenge to say, what can we do to help this demographic? What can we do better? What's going to be our future of healthcare? Um, and, and this is what... Um, this is what I want to talk about for the rest of my time. Um, it, it starts with the end quote from Dr. Seuss's book, You're Only Old Once. And if you haven't read Dr. Seuss, you should be reading him like on a regular basis because he's mind-blowingly brilliant. Um, you're in pretty good shape for the shape you're in. Um, there's a thing in geriatrics. Yeah, I know, right? It's a left-handed compliment. Um, but here's the thing, and this is why I put it on there. It turns out if you hospitalize 85-year-olds like I just described, do they get better? They don't get better. Listen, if I do everything right, they stay the same to where they once were. But the problem is, is that in most hospitals in this country, when you admit an 85-year-old like we just described, they get worse. They have a functional disability. So you come in functional. And I love that picture of my grandparents because functionality to them was living on their own, reading, being with each other. Functionality decreases when you hospitalize people, which means I don't live on my own anymore. And I'm at nursing homes and other things, and that's a big deal. I don't walk as well, I don't see as well. So how do we keep people pretty good shape for the shape they're in? Well, it starts with screening. We start this in the emergency department when you hit the door, and our nurses do it and our doctors do it, and we ask questions. Look at this list, guys. There's no magic to this. Did you need help when you came in? After you got sick, did you need more help? Right? Have you been hospitalized before in the last six months? Do you see well? Do you hear well? Do you have problems with your memory? And do you take medications? Not a tough list. But this is a pretty well-known screening for what's called frailty in the geriatric community. If I screen them and I know that they're frail to begin with, I can offer them some extra things to hopefully keep them at their functional level from what they were before. We do some treatment protocols. We talked about under-treatment and over-treatment, so we try to protocolize some of this stuff. Um, a, a lot of hospitals have done this, and so I like this example. We start talking about urinary catheters. Um, urinary catheters um, is a classic over-treatment. We put catheters in your bladder so that you don't urinate and things like that. But it turns out that if you do that to an older population, they get delirious, they get infections, they stay longer, they fall down, they get worse, right? So we stop doing it, unless you absolutely need it. We got them up. So this is a team sport. Nurses, doctors, physical therapists, occupational therapists, right? Get them up, right? Because if I get them up and moving, then they turn out they don't have as much of a functional decline, and they don't get blood clots in their legs. They don't get lots of other stuff that keeps them in the hospital. Manage the drugs. <laughs> so this is a 25-year-old that was at Coachella last month. <laughs> You like that one, right? Um, uh, team sport, right? We get our pharmacists involved, and we get them involved early. Why? Because the medications are a big deal. They're a big deal in the hospital. They're a big deal with what you came in with. And they're going to be an even bigger deal with what I send you home with. Most of the time, when you come in for a medical problem, and I try to fix that, and I send you home, I'm going to say you're going to need three other medications. Well, if you're already taking 12, and now you're taking 15, nah, right? And that's the interaction thing that we talked about. People are getting sick from their medicines, and we've got to manage that. And then ultimately what we did and what we said to ourselves is, listen, this is not a hospital issue. It's a hospital issue and a home issue and a care provider issue and a continuum of care issue. So we moved it outside the hospital. We put the center part of it in the emergency department, which we sort of see as a little bit of a go-between between between the outpatient and the inpatient. Um, And we set up a continuum where we said, you know, the same people that are doing the expert care in the hospital are going to see you like your paramedics, right, two days after your discharge. Because I know if I see you two days after your discharge, you're less likely to come back to me in a, in a month. I can see if you're taking your medications. Turns out if you send somebody home and then you explain to them what we tried to explain to you in the hospital, maybe you hear it differently. Maybe I get a chance to talk to your care provider. So this is what we do. We communicate. We do consistency. And our whole team does this both inpatient, outpatient, in the emergency department to set up that continuum. 
Our hope is, is that we're able to take you in the shape you're in, let you get better, and keep you in the shape you're in because the functionality of your 85-year-old friend and family hopefully stays that way so that you live out the rest of your life happy and functional the way that you want to do it. So that's our program. The Senior Emergency Department, the Geriatric Wing, and the Transitional Care Program for Seniors at Encino Hospital Medical Center. I think it's a lot of what you guys are doing with the paramedics. Um, and I'm excited to see what it brings in the future. Thank you. Thank you.